So, dry times, evil times, difficult times, the bad in general. Know in your heart it's a blessing. How else could you value that which is good if you didn't know that which was bad? By distinction. In other words, you take a neutrality and you separate it out into plus and minus, which together is a neutrality, but you wish to understand the good. So you separate it out. That's what God's done. He's taken the neutrality of nothing and he's divided it and created positive and negative, plus and minus, above and below, heat and cold, contrast, duality. I think my um, sign on 14th of June, my physical birth, I'm Gemini, you see, it's twins, I think it's, I think it's in my left and right hemisphere, you know, it's, it's the duality, do you see? He's created the duality of good and evil, so that you can distill from that something good and create, you know, the pure positive side is creation, the pure negative side is destruction. And so you take nothing and you create um, heaven and earth, if you like. Uh, actually, you create the, the earth is the, is the creation of the apparently nothing, from the nothing to the something, physical, you know, the atom, the matter, and the space. And uh, in it we find a transcendence into I don't know what. Into the plurality that God longed for from his oneness. And that's what this is the experience of, this desire that God has for communion, for family, for sharing, for the fun of not being one, but having a vast, harmonious, lovely family. And how has God conceived of this? That such desire should be with him? Well, he found it on introspection when he looked at himself. We thought, yes, this being that I am is very lovely, but more beyond what is more beyond who I am? Well, more of, more of I am's, more others. Great desire for family. I don't mean by that cleanse of himself. I mean rather like the flowers of a beautiful garden. Everyone different. Everyone lovely everyone perfect, everyone contributing to the Eden, the haven, the heaven of what he experiences. And what they all experience. And this is the loveliness of God. We are born of his desire. How wonderful. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Let me try this for a moment. Zero and infinity are undefined in that nothing
can't be explained by something, only its absence. And infinity is, by definition, <laughs> undefined, which is a sort of oxymoron, self-contradiction. I mean, I have defined zero, and I have defined infinity, but it doesn't have a doesn't have the tangibility that the other numbers have. Everything else is, of course, in between. But in in between two intangibles, I can't show you infinity. I can't show you nothing. I can have something and take it away. And that implies an absence of something. But that's not something in itself. On the contrary, it's zero, it's nothing. How could you define nothing? There's nothing to define. It's empty. Even it, it's a slight puzzle. It's a conundrum. So is eternity or infinity. It's, it can be implied, but it can't be materialized, handled. You can't handle nothing, it's not there. How do I handle it? Or not handle it? And what does it mean? It makes handling, it makes handling meaningless. And perhaps infinity too, um, it's undefined, it's unlimited, therefore it can't be materialized, because it's unlimited, it's in a different dimension. What we, take to be thought, an idea, that's, the only evidence of its existence, and yet it does seem to exist. And without assuming such exists, some things can't be demonstrated as reasonable or or rational, and yet the proof relies on something that does not tangibly exist. Very strange, you see. Very strange. So we come to closer, that's all we can say, I suppose, to the understanding of the nature of God. And you can see why Eastern Hindu type religion has the view that there's a great cycle when all of creation comes to an end. It's wound up. And if you like, there's a long period of no creation, and then it's all thrown forth again, which is a bit like the scientist Big Bang Theory, isn't it? That it all collapses into, you could say one, but perhaps it collapses into nothing, and we don't understand what nothing is, but it can explode into something, and back to nothing, it might collapse. I don't think the Big Bang Theory holds a great deal of credit now, but um, we're into other theories. Continuous creation. Big Bang's happening all over the place. Multi-universes, infinite number of all the possibilities being played at once. Infinity of infinity of infinity. without end. Perhaps nothing at all. (laughs) Well, I take refuge in the Buddha here that there's no point in uh, struggling to understand things that are not useful, things that are not helpful, 
valuable things that don't seem to promise life or at least they promise it in such a long and tortuous and dragged out way that it might take an infinity of lifetimes to get there better to take the high road straight up translation straight into whatever it is but to understand God I wonder if it does keep on creating forever or whether the creation in these dimensions has a rest while he runs others, or whether he closes them all down for a while as a rest, and then comes back again, or whether the whole concept is simply invalid, or we live in the realm of uncertainty here, in this realm, and we trust it for a good reason. We have good reason to trust because it seems that from nowhere we've come into existence. And most people seem to be preoccupied, if anything, if they dare risk it, I suppose preoccupied is the wrong word, but if anything, they think of death, not life. Well, that's their fear anyway. And yet life in all its goodness came from nowhere. Well, I suppose it should finish now. And they might say, of course, no, life came with all its problems of death, but that's the opposite of life, isn't it? Life came from nowhere. Death was reliant on life existing. You can't have death without life first being there. But life came from the nowhere, supposedly, from our perspective, that is. That's an astonishing hope that that raises in us, isn't it? The wishful, wishful thinking. The fairies, you know, uh, make a wish, come true. Why not? Life exists apparently from nowhere. Why not other things existing from nowhere? Or perhaps it exists from the same where, a place. Speech even, a magic chant. You can see how these things, in a sense, quite reasonably develop, don't they? Yes, let me pause for a moment. There is a foundation of being behind being and not being. Something of the completeness of knowing both, of both existing. If you imagine combining something with nothing, what do you get? Do you get a neutrality, a wipeout of the something, or a wipeout of the nothing, or something in between? Or do you only get one or the other? You cannot add two undefined things together. That's simply a thing that can't be done at our level of comprehension. You say it's meaningless, it's quite simply not helpful in the dimension that we're in. 
but it may be fundamental to why our dimension seems to exist and all other dimensions and lack of them. We're in the realm of, yes, God, if you like, can be creator. But how did God get created? Where in the system of understanding is the self-creation? And what is the self? Because without its creation, there can't be a self. It's as if we sit here and prove that we can't exist. But our experience tells us that we can. And we are. And we have done. So we're left with the ultimate Zen contemplation. That there's no explanation. The mind stops. And I'm simply left with the result of my experience. And even if it were a dream and is a dream, it leads me to say, thank you, heavenly Father. How amazing, amazing that I don't know and do not understand. And yet you bless us with our fantastic experience of this dream that we call reality and that we wish to transcend from. To enjoy communion with you and we do and we are in communion with you in thought and in feeling and in experience Thank you, Heavenly Father.